Hello and welcome to another episode of MRCOG Mastery in 10 Questions brought to you by ACE Courses. In this video, we are going to address ovarian cancer in 10 questions. Let's start with the basics. Question one, what are the key epidemiological facts about ovarian cancer? Let me give you four facts that you can commit to your memory. The first is that it is the eighth commonest cancer in women worldwide. Some 300,000 new cases are reported every year globally. In the UK, we have about 7,500 new cases every year. The second fact is that the lifetime risk of a woman developing ovarian cancer is approximately 2%. The third is that the mortality rates are high and haven't changed much over the years. The overall five-year survival rate in the UK is only about 30 to 40 percent. Some 4,000 women die from ovarian cancer every year in the UK, and this is more than all the deaths from other gynecological cancers put together. The fourth is that the peak incidence of ovarian cancer is in women aged 75 to 84 years. Question two, what are the risk factors for ovarian cancer? A simple rule to remember is that the greater the number of ovulation cycles in the lifetime of a woman, the greater the risk of ovarian cancer. So risk factors include early menarche, late menopause, nulliparity, subfertility, use of hormone replacement therapy, smoking, obesity, endometriosis, diabetes, and the use of talcum powder in the genital area is also a risk factor for ovarian cancer. And of course, there are certain genetic predispositions that would increase the risk of ovarian cancer. We will look at them in another question later. Question three, what are the protective factors for ovarian cancer? Again, a simple rule is that the fewer the number of ovulation cycles, the lower the risk of ovarian cancer. So protective factors include the use of combined oral contraceptive pill, and the risk reduction is by about 50%. Pregnancy, breastfeeding, salpingectomy, and tubal sterilization are also protective against ovarian cancer. Question four, what are the genetic conditions that predispose a woman to ovarian cancer? We have a whole video on this on our website, but briefly, there are three conditions that you need to be aware of. The first is BRCA1. This confers a 30 to 45% risk of ovarian cancer. The second is BRCA2. This confers a 10 to 20% risk of ovarian cancer. And thirdly, HNPCC, which is hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer syndrome, also known as Lynch syndrome, and this confers about 9 to 12% risk of ovarian cancer. Women with these genetic predispositions should be referred for genetic counselling and they should consider risk-reducing prophylactic surgery once they have completed their family. Question 5. Should you screen for ovarian cancer? Now, ovarian cancer often presents in advanced stage, so you can see the desire to want to screen and identify the cases early in the hope of modifying the outcome. However, we need to remember screening or screen positive patients will often need to have surgical intervention, which carries risks of its own. So if there are too many false positives in the screening, we may end up doing a lot of surgery and overall maybe causing harm. 
So a proper trial was needed to answer this question and the UKC Tox trial did that. The investigators used a combination of CA125 and pelvic ultrasound scan to screen for ovarian cancer, comparing this to no screening. Unfortunately, they didn't find a reduction in mortality rate with screening. So at the moment, there is insufficient evidence to recommend routine screening for ovarian cancer. But remember, this is routine screening that we are talking about. But if women have symptoms, they will need to be fully investigated. Question six, what are the presenting symptoms for ovarian cancer? This cancer is often referred to as the silent killer because many women with this condition don't have any symptoms or have only vague symptoms until the disease is advanced. Did you know that some 50% of women with ovarian cancer will present to a specialty other than gynecology, for example, to a physician with symptoms that may be consistent with irritable bowel syndrome? Now, when symptoms do manifest, they can include abdominal bloating, loss of appetite, change in bowel habit, urinary symptoms, abdominal pain, and less commonly, vaginal bleeding. Question 7. What investigations are needed in someone suspected of having ovarian cancer? Firstly, don't forget to do the, the general blood workup. That is, full blood count, use an ease and LFTs. Second, you will need to do tumour markers the main one, of course, being CA125. But remember, a raised CA125 is neither very sensitive nor specific, meaning it may not be raised in those with ovarian cancer, but a raised level does not mean that a woman has ovarian cancer. In women under the age of 40 years, it is worthwhile doing AFP, HCG and LDH to look for germ cell and stromal ovarian tumours. Thirdly, transvaginal pelvic ultrasound scan, which should be assessed against the IOTA classification system for ovarian tumours. The CA125 result, the ultrasound findings, and the menopausal status can all be combined to work out the risk of malignancy index or RMI. Finally, a CT scan of the chest, abdomen and pelvis can be used to look for metastases. Question 8. How do you stage ovarian cancer? Ovarian cancer is staged using the FIGO classification Staging laparotomy is done through a midline laparotomy. It will include hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, omentectomy, lymph node biopsy, peritoneal biopsy, pelvic washings, and debulking of all visible tumour. The upper abdomen should also be fully examined. For learning the staging, I strongly urge you to find a figure that you like from the internet and print it off and stick it on the wall so that you can look at it until it is fully embedded in your memory. But briefly, stage one is when cancer is limited to one or both ovaries. 1A is in one ovary, 1B is when the cancer is in both ovaries. Stage 2 is when the cancer has extended but is still within the pelvis. Stage 3 is when the cancer has extended beyond the pelvic brim and into the abdomen but not beyond the abdominal cavity. Stage 4 is when there are distant metastases, for example, secondaries in the lungs. Question 9. How do you treat ovarian cancer? 
Surgery and platinum-based chemotherapy are the cornerstone of ovarian cancer treatment. Total macroscopic debulking is associated with better progression-free survival and overall survival. So the aim is to remove all visible tumour. This needs to be done by a gynaecological oncology surgeon working in a cancer centre. Following surgery, chemotherapy is recommended for all patients other than those with low-risk early stage, that is stage 1A or 1B, cancer. The usual regimen of chemotherapy is six cycles of carboplatin and paclitaxel. In advanced cancer, it is an option to use neoadjuvant chemotherapy before surgery as it may reduce morbidity but without compromising overall survival. In this case, the patient receives three cycles of chemotherapy, then she will have interval debulking surgery and then she will have another three cycles of chemotherapy after surgery. Final question, how do you manage a patient with recurrent ovarian cancer? This is a difficult situation and there is a lot of controversy and debate about the options. The usual treatment is with combination chemotherapy with drugs such as carboplatin, paclitaxel, gemcitabine and liposomal doxyrubicin. Debulking surgery may be of benefit in platinum sensitive recurrence, but we are not really sure. Given the complexity of the situation, an MDT discussion is necessary to work through the options. Well, that is the end of the lesson. I hope you find this lesson instructive and I look forward to seeing you in a future video or indeed at our weekend intensive MRCOG course. Until we meet again, have fun with your revision.